Any mission to Mars needs a source of power. Whether it be a rover or lander that needs this electricity to meet their ideal tasks, or if it's a manned mission where this power actually keeps the astronauts alive by giving them oxygen to breathe and water to drink. How will we create this energy for our astronauts, and what's the best way of doing so on Mars? Let's talk about that. So first, let's talk about how much an astronaut would need on Mars. For a temporary mission, scientists predict that we would need around 50 kilowatts per astronaut. And for a permanent settlement, we're getting lower to around 20 to 30 kilowatts. Now to put in perspective, the average light bulb is about 100 watts. Therefore, in order to keep an astronaut alive, it's about equivalent to 200 to 500 light bulbs being lit up. So when we talk about power, it's important to discuss the five different ways of producing this electricity. And here on Earth, it's most commonly known as fossil fuels or natural gases, geothermal energy, wind energy or wind turbines, solar panels, and nuclear energy. Now keep note that a lot of these processes would require having batteries on Mars, but we're not going to get too in-depth on batteries, but rather talk about how to produce this energy overall. Now one of these we can get rid of right away, and that is fossil fuels. NASA has never found fossil fuels on Mars, and if they did, that would mean that life once existed there. However, the carbon dioxide rich atmosphere on Mars wouldn't even allow us to burn these fossil fuels. Therefore, it would be extremely difficult and we would have to provide the oxygen. In addition, we would be able to burn methane that we either collect or recreate. However, that would be inefficient because we would be working backwards. We would be creating the methane that we then want to burn, so we would be losing more energy in the entire process. However, methane and liquid oxygen could be used in an emergency situation, whereas some of the other functions might have went down. And the next source of power is geothermal energy. In a previous episode, I said that the Martian inner core was actually solid. However, that's incorrect. Recent studies at Goddard Space Flight Center show that the Mars orbiters are actually wobbling in their orbit. And after understanding that data, they're theorizing that the inner core is actually molten. And since it's molten, that means that there could be a lot of geothermal activity still on the planet. Now the upcoming InSight mission is going to give us a lot of information about how exactly the inner core is and how the planet formed. However, it might also tell us where some hot water beds or hot lakes underneath the surface are. Now the issue with geothermal electricity is that we'd have to drill into these hot lakes and it's theorized that these could be kilometers or miles below the surface. Next up is wind energy and this one is rather controversial. Mars experiences upwards of 60 miles per hour winds which sounds great. However, because of the low atmospheric pressure and the low atmospheric density on Mars, that makes creating energy in terms of wind turbines very difficult. Imagine trying to paddle a canoe. When you paddle a canoe, you're pushing directly against the water because the water has high density. However, if you took that exact same paddle and went in a hot air balloon and tried to paddle your way forward, it would basically be useless just because the density of the air is nowhere near as dense as the density of the water. Therefore, you'd basically be pushing against nothing. The same thing on Mars. The density of the air on Mars is so small that it wouldn't be able to push those turbines nearly at all. However, there is an upside to this. Creating wind energy is rather straightforward. It just requires a lot of structural materials. And it's theorized that the first materials that we actually mine from Mars will be structural material. Therefore, we could use these materials that we mine on Mars to create wind turbines. Although they might not be as efficient as some of the other methods of energy, they would give us a little bit more to work with. So this leaves us with solar and nuclear energy. And these two are the most talked about energy sources when we discuss Mars. For example, the Opportunity and Curiosity rovers, which are the two functioning rovers on Mars right now, one of which is powered by solar panels, the other one is powered by nuclear energy. So let's start off with solar energy. The benefit of solar panels is that they're relatively easy to maintain and put up. Some of the only maintenance that would be needed is maybe rewiring or cleaning off the panels after a dust storm. However, when we talk about some of the downsides, there's a lot of them. The first one being that Mars is farther away from the sun than Earth is. Therefore, it experiences less sunlight. However, Mars does make up for this because of its lower atmosphere. Sunlight is affected by the atmosphere on Earth more than Mars just because there are more particles in the way. So when you combine these two offsets, you get to a region where the efficiency of solar panels on Mars would be about how efficient they are here in the United States on average. Not as well off as some of the hotter states like New Mexico or Arizona, 
Now another main downside to solar panels is that they take up a lot of space and they're not always functional. And when I say not as functional, I mean that when they're not in sunlight, they won't provide that much power. Whether it be nighttime, which is half the time on Mars, or during a dust storm, it could hinder how much electricity you could get. For example, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers experienced a dust storm that was so massive that it dropped their power reserves much lower than they had ever gone before. And something like this would be catastrophic to a colony on Mars that just used solar panels. So now let's talk about nuclear energy. This is basically the opposite of solar energy. It's very power dense, meaning that it doesn't take up a lot of space, and it always functions, whether it be day or night or during a dust storm. One of the main downsides to nuclear reactors is the maintenance. Astronauts would have to understand the ins and outs of the entire reactor and how to fix it if anything went wrong. And if a colony was dependent on one or two nuclear reactors and one of them was to fail, that too would be catastrophic to the colony. However, NASA is trying to fix this maintenance problem. They're working on a project called Kilopower, which is making small nuclear reactors that create anywhere from 1 to 10 kilowatts of power that can be used to send to Mars. So it's very interesting to talk about nuclear and solar energy because we have this fine balance between efficiency and simplicity in terms of what the astronauts will use. Personally, I believe that the first missions will use both. And here's why. During the transfer from Earth to Mars, I believe we're going to be using solar panels. And due to the fact that solar energy is a little bit more efficient in space than it is underneath an atmosphere, I think that we're going to require a lot of our electricity to be in the form of solar panels. Now to put into perspective, the solar panels on the International Space Station create anywhere from 80 to 125 kilowatts of energy when the entire station uses on average around 80 kilowatts. Now we're talking about a capsule that has solar panels on it and that capsule will land on Mars, for example the Big Falcon rocket, then we'll be able to use those solar panels both in the transfer and once we get to the surface. Now if we have cargo ships that arrive at the red planet before we do, those could carry nuclear reactors or kilopower modules that NASA's working on. And this is important because the cargo ships won't be manned. Therefore you won't have to worry about the radiation and if it's functioning once you get there all you have to do is link it up to your power grid and then you have enough energy to explore the surrounding land. So now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about biological energy, or food. In the next episode, we're going to discuss how much food we're going to need to bring to Mars, how we will produce food on the red planet, and what will our greenhouses look like. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.